Yes, Sudhu, thank you for doing this interview. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. So um, I, I, I'm trying to understand the underlying beliefs and assumptions that drive entrepreneurial behavior. Sure. So could do you tell us what influenced you to become entrepreneurial? Do you have entrepreneurial parents mm. or did you mm. kind of fall into this or, mm. or how did that happen? Um, I think I would say it's a, it's a, there's a few things over my journey, like during high school, childhood background, um, things that I discovered in university and programs that um, instilled certain skills in me up until now. So um, I think in high school or let's, my, let's say my schooling career, I was always encouraged by my parents to kind of be creative and to solve problems. That was like something that was actually actively instilled by my mom. So buying me puzzle, um, puzzle boxes, um, doing the entrepreneur day at, at grade seven when you come up with the product and you sell it. Um, and this idea of kind of, yeah, creating your own pocket money in high school and like I'd sell all sorts of things. And so that was already something in my childhood, even though I wouldn't say I thought of myself as an entrepreneur. You, you just, did or you did not? I didn't, no, I didn't. I only started thinking of myself as an entrepreneur maybe two years ago, actually. Um, so that, so those are the, some of the things I'd say in my childhood um, that might have influenced me. My dad was an entrepreneur, so my dad used to work for the Department of Housing and he stopped after like 10 years and to, to start his own thing, which for the majority of my life, he's always had his own business. And my mom, having been in corporate, and she still is in corporate, she's always wanted to do something, uh. her own thing. Always, always, always spoken about how she wants to do her own thing. Always spoken about just the feeling of creating something on your own. So I think from, from high school, I kind of had this idea that going into the workplace environment or corporate isn't necessarily the best thing. Just from my parents and that kind of um, anti the status quo, that kind of feeling and energy that I got from my dad. He was yeah. very much, you know, he'd wear shorts every single day. He had his own company and he was always about doing your own thing. Yeah. Um, so you were raised in that environment I that was, kind of yeah. cultivated those. Yeah. But it's interesting, like no one ever taught you to specifically to be an entrepreneur? No, no. So after high school, I came in and I became a part of the Alan Gray Obers Foundation. And I'd say probably that was the first time I got actual entrepreneurship education. But even um, throughout the four year program, I didn't think I was an entrepreneur. I actually only realized that I was an, an entrepreneur once I went to the Mandela Rose Foundation. And there we did a leadership program, it was a year long leadership program. And it was just essentially about understanding yourself, understanding your strengths and your weaknesses. And I'd say it was in that year that just doing a lot of the personal mastery kind of work that I was like, okay, this is where I am. This is, I like solving problems and I can actually do this and I like this. And then that's when I was like, I actually want to do it. And that came at a time when there was a problem that I'd realized that I wanted to solve. And mm -hmm. so that kind of thinking of, I can do it and this is who I am and I know what my strengths are and everything that came from that course with the perfect timing of having a problem that I wanted to solve then led me to start something and to be driven to start something. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it just happened at the same time you're doing the leadership training. Yeah. You had that ha-ha moment and it's about the same time. Yeah. But also... I, I would say I've always been an entrepreneur, um, but it's just the, it coming to me, it came at a certain time where I'd had kind of that program that, you know, you, you, you learn about yourself, you do a lot of reflection about what you want to do, what you've done. And, and so that's when it actually came up to me. But I'd always been an entrepreneur. Um, even now, when I look back at, you know, high school and all the things that I was doing, um, I just never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. So how was that different from your peers, like in high school, for example? Completely different. Um, my peers, I would say, just, be, even based on how they grew up, you know, their parents, it's very much, you go to school, I'm lucky because my parents were completely different. So for them, it's you go to school, you, you get a job and, and you do that. There wasn't sort of any um, encouraging of thinking outside of the box, which is my parents made it a thing to encourage me to think out, outside yeah. the box. That was their thing. They wanted to make sure that I was not um, confined to one specific thing. I mean, everything they wanted to show me was to just make sure that I want to do what I want to do. And even if that means me taking the time to take a, a, a gap year or to, to do what, what, whatever it is that I wanted to do, they wanted to instill that in me. 
Whereas with my friends, I know that's not an option. You don't take a gap year. You don't um, you do something else other than being a lawyer or a teacher or this and that. And so I think even having the freedom to think about, you know, even though it does take longer than everyone else who's like after university, oh, I definitely want to be a lawyer. Because you have that freedom, it takes longer to actually figure out what you want to do. But right. once you actually think about it, then you get to not even have that um, confidence in yourself to actually carry out and do it because you've been given that space to right. kind of feel it yeah. out. Yeah. You get the freedom to explore exactly. a little bit. Yeah. But it's interesting, something you said is that, that, that um, you know, you said, I never thought of myself an entrepreneur until mm. like, I, you know, I was mm. being entrepreneurial, but yet mm. I didn't, th I hear that Even a lot. Even when I did an entrepreneurial program at the Allen Grove Overs Foundation for four years, I still didn't think I was entrepreneurial. I don't know why. Um, I guess it just speaks to maybe whether you can be taught entrepreneurship, because maybe in that four years I should have been like, oh yeah, I, I'm an entrepreneur, I've been taught entrepreneurship. Um, but it was really something that needed to I needed to realize it within myself. And I think being a young person and not having a lot of leadership development and the soft skills development, um, not really having a very good self-awareness of yourself, that probably played a, a large role in me not wanting to be in an, or thinking that I'm not an entrepreneur. Yeah. In a world where um, people go to university, then they go to corporate and they stay there. So coming, trying to unpack these questions for yourselves. Am I an entrepreneur? What does that even look like? It needs some sort of like nurture or some sort of um, something that's going to allow you to be self-aware and to realize that you can do it and that you, you probably are that person. But in terms of there being a curricula that can actually um, make you think that way or make you believe that you're an entrepreneur, I don't know. Because like I said, I was in a four-year program and I, during that four-year program, I was like, oh, I'm definitely not an entrepreneur. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So what was the first entrepreneurial thing that you wind up doing? Um, so at the time, I, I guess I had the entrepreneurial bug in me because of being around entrepreneurship in the Obis Foundation. So I really wanted to actually do something, um, try to solve problems and you know, try, try to figure something out. Um, so one of the things that I started doing was interning with startups. Um, so mm. very early stage startups, which was probably my favorite thing ever. I learned the most there about just the culture of entrepreneurship. So I worked with two, um, they're also fellows, um, a year older than me, and they'd started an, a, a startup, it was in 2017, worked with them for three months. And that, I would say, is probably one of the most impactful things in me actually wanting to actually start something. As soon sure. as I finished that in, in internship, I was like, I, I just looking at them, doing what they want to do, doing things that I thought that I want to do and they're actually doing it and just being with them every single day, seeing them wait, being self-motivated, waking up every day, we're working on our business, this is what we're doing, the hard work, but just the passion of driving something that's yours yeah. and knowing that I'd had those ideas that I had my own things that I wanted to drive, but I wasn't doing it then. Um, I think seeing it and being in that space and interning for them really made me want to do it and to be like, this is something that I can do. It's, it's possible for me to do it. So, so the startup you worked for, they were yeah. younger? The, yes, they were the, two year, a year older than me. So basically so same the, age. So your peers? So basically same age. So, so do you think that's part of the thing? Like you see the sausage getting made yeah. You see the relatable social models, you're thinking, you, well, wait a minute, I can do this. It's, yeah. So it took the mystery out of it? Yes, I think it, it demystified it. It was, because I mean, I, the reason I actually didn't think I was an entrepreneur, I think, is because I saw people as entrepreneurs as this, like, you know, like you, you're a Iconic. Superman, exactly, yeah. like a Superman type of person. Like, yeah. I'd be like, oh, well, how would I ever be able to deal with, it with entrepreneurship? I have high anxiety. I'm not going to be able to be this quick witted, be able to make decisions, you know, on the spot, whatever it is that I thought entrepreneurship was at the time. And then when I saw two people like me doing it, you know, it's just hard work every day. That's all it is. It's just, yeah. you know, this is what we need to do, then we do it. There's nothing, you know, amazing about it, it's just you get up and you do it. And I, I think that's what I saw from them. You just get up and you do it. But, but the interesting thing to me is, is um, you know, for entrepreneurs, like work isn't work. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like I know most what you people, mean. I mean, you see on social media, people are always going, uh, you know, it's Monday, this is how much coffee I have yeah. to drink to go to work, and I hate yeah. my job. And I feel sorry for them. Yeah. It's like, your life 
Yeah. It's going to suck if you yeah. like have that attitude. It's because you're doing something that you don't want to be doing in a job or that you, you're doing you don't it just have for agency. the money. Exactly, exactly. The nice thing about entrepreneurship is that you have agency in your day to to That's dictate it. whatever. So I wake up in the mornings as much as there isn't a timetable for me to be from nine to, to five to go to work. I have like that nine to five bracket to decide for myself what I want to do for my business that I've created. Yeah. It's so fulfilling. It's, yeah. it's, it's just, yeah, that, that, that ability to have that agency to decide what you want to do. And I've always been someone who's just, my big thing is about freedom just having complete freedom again coming to my childhood and my parents instilling that idea in me. So me being in a situation where I don't have agency, I don't have complete freedom, it, it just doesn't really align to what it is that I want to do. And I think entrepreneurship was the one thing that for me gave, gave me that. And even now that I am an entrepreneur, I mean, it's, I, I talk about it all the time. My days are always different, um, but they're so fulfilling. They're so fulfilling just working sometimes they can be crazy days like last week was a hectic week where we were working like the first three days was just you know work 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 um but it, it wasn't anything that i was like re resentful of because at the end of the day i'm working towards three projects that i'm very passionate about that i helped initiate mm -hmm. and that are now moving forward by the work that i can see i'm putting towards them yeah. and is making them yeah. come to fruition yeah. yeah yeah and i think it's that feeling of just watching something grow that you is part of your or is driven by your vision and the small work that you put in is making it create outputs that's what actually drives you ways and know in a company if you're in a company you're working in one specific space where you're doing something technical or something very small you're fixing one cog of the, the ultimate output you don't really see what it is that you're doing yeah the other part of that is, is that you're being told to do it by someone else exactly which really seriously undermines the motivation exactly there's there's, there's less sense of autonomy you don't yeah. have this sense of agency you know i've studied um human motivation mm. and you know children will draw all day long mm. and as soon as you introduce the expectation of a reward for drawing they'll they, lose interest yeah. in drawing. I'm not surprised, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm listening to you, you know, describe this experience, and I, I, you think about, you know, most people don't even know there's another option. Exactly, exactly. Right? They're just, they're good. in school, we're taught. Exactly, exactly. That, that you're going to work for somebody else. Exactly. They're going to tell you what to do, and they're going to pay you for it. Yeah, exactly. And you can have a house and a car and a life and... and, and yeah. It's not really going to be very exciting or very yeah. meaningful or, or yeah, impactful. Fulfilling, yeah. So I think working in that startup, it just showed me, yes, that's what I want. That agency in my day, just doing something and just also seeing them that they're normal people like me. It's They're not Steve Jobs or whatever. They're normal people like me and they have that agency that I want. It's possible for me to live that life. I can actually do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think... You know, more people need to be around, and that, that, that's a, you know, uh, I've interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs around the world, and what I keep hearing in the story mm. is some sort of a random, um, I want to say, exchange or mm. interaction with an entrepreneur, mm. whether it was a mentor or mm. an uncle or an experience like you had, like I was part of a startup mm. and I got to see how this works, and I had the realization, like, oh. Yeah. This isn't that complicated. The work is difficult. Yeah. I mean, with them, it was even nicer because they were fellows. So then they told me about all these other programs that I had no idea about in the Orbis Foundation and the incubators. I was like, oh, it's, it's possible to make it happen. You could just get into yeah. an incubator, get mentors, do this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that sold me. That sold me to the life of entrepreneurship. So what was the first idea that you, you latched upon? So at that time, I was in my first year of my master's year. And I was trying to come up with a topic for my master's thesis. And I didn't want it to be anything based on the theory or just, um, I wanted it to be real. So I wanted to, it to be aligned to something that I'm actually doing. So I actually took that, because I was on this journey and I was very much aware that I'm on this journey of wanting to actually become an entrepreneur and of, of actually wanting to start something. And at some point now that I've had exposure to a startup and I have exposure to Alan Gray Orbis Foundation, I want to actually do it and hold myself accountable. So don't do this thing of yours where you have an idea and you just let it go. I was like, I'm tired of that. I actually want to do something. So 
my masters gave me the perfect opportunity to do that because um, I could spend a year working on something and it can be a business and it's my, I'm studying economics, so it, it makes sense, I could link it in somehow. And um, in kind of just brainstorming and thinking about what it is that I like, I'd been reading a lot about the clothing and textile sector mm. in South Africa, how important it is for development. I'm a development scholar, so it's, we studied it a lot. And I was just thinking about like, okay, so how could this sector be revised and um, revived in South Africa, given that we're a developing country, given that we need, um, we have a very high surplus, um, surplus low skilled labor. And so we need basically a sector that's labor intensive. We know economic theory is telling me all sorts of things that the mining sector is not really doing it anymore for South Africa for a lot of reasons. Um, the services sector is not the best for development in a country with high unemployment. So the solution is kind of to find something that could be in a labor, labor intensified um, sector. Clothing and textile sector fits that, but how could we revive it? Because we know right now it's kind of dead. So just thinking about all of those things, and then it lit. And I generally am someone who likes clothing, so just always wanting have wanted to start something in the clothing space, but something with impact. I don't want to just start a, a t-shirt line. To or, make yourself money. Yeah, yeah I yeah, wanted yeah. to actually solve a problem. So I was like, cool. This thesis is giving me a good platform to kind of learn more about what the problems are in the industry that I care about and um, ended up learning about textile waste being a huge problem in the clothing and textile sector and how there's like 90 million tons of textile waste in landfill and um, so I was like okay this is interesting uh, how about you know if you could take te textile waste and make that into fresh new fabric and uh, use it as an input because currently how the industry is doing it is they make something and then they sell it and then it creates waste. So I was like, maybe if we could use that waste, use it as an input somehow, you know what I mean? Get circular economy. I'm thinking about green growth and sustainable development because um, that's where the world is going. So I'm like, if in any case, if we're gonna revitalize the clothing and textile sector, it's probably gonna have to be in the green space. So I'm thinking of all these things yeah. And I mean, I probably I came up with an idea, and then you read something more. You're like, oh, this is now the real problem. Actually, scratch that yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. Read something else. You're like, oh, this is actually the real problem. So and that came with the idea of textile recycling. So using textile waste and um, breaking it down to its fiber form, re-spinning those fibers, and making completely fresh new yarn and fabric from that. And that's the current idea that we're pursuing now. Okay. So, but but you said a lot there. I want to unpack a little bit, like. Um, you know, can you dig into this a little more, the idea uh, of problem finding? Yeah. I guess you would call it, right? Yeah. Like you, you thought you were going to solve one problem, and as you started to dig in, you realized that's not really, really the problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lot to be said there, because a lot of people fail because they don't do that. That wasn't the first problem I even tried to solve, so that's the one that I'm actually pursuing, and maybe it's the one that I actually found a problem. But I've been trying to find a problem for years to solve, maybe two years. Mm. Um, me being a part of a startup was part of that journey of trying to figure out a problem. I'd started, um, because I'm heavily into research, I'd started a research, and I was an independent, uh, like a freelance researcher. So that was something that I was trying to see, is there space in the market for this type of freelance research or whatever. I did that, didn't work out, moved on to something else, um, create an entrepreneurial program with my other two friends for, we wanted to teach it to students in disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, maybe through a CSI, so have this program through CSI, kind of uh, a company pays for it and then we get to teach the students. Um, and then that didn't work out. And then that was my third, the clothing and textile idea in the time of coming up with my thesis. That was then the third idea that I ended up coming mm. up with. But even then, I'll tell you, that was 2017. The idea has changed so many yeah. times. Um, because you pivot and you find something new, you go test and market, you change it, you tweak it. And um, I, I think that's how it should be. And that's, that's the fun part of it, really, um, is to just letting it take you to where the problem is. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I define it as sort of like an opportunity discovery process. Mm. It's stressful, but it's very you, stressful. Yeah. But, but and, and it's you know, so many famous thinkers have said, you know, when an I when an adventure does succeed, this mm. is Peter Drucker mm. saying, when an idea does succeed, mm. you know, more often than not, it's it's in a place that the founder didn't anticipate. Yeah. It's being used. The product's being used in a way they never anticipated. Yes. by people they never anticipated. It's it's never. Yeah, you know, the American poet Robert Frost. Um, he wrote a. He said once, "I never wrote a poem 
whose end I knew when I began. Yeah, yeah. And it's said as that, right? Yeah. Like, I think when I'd started this, I would have thought that I would have known the end, which is, this is not the end, obviously. But that idea that we started with was merely a trigger towards inquiry into a, this problem that we actually knew nothing about. We assumed, you know, new stuff. Then, obviously, later on, you speak to customers, you find out more about the problem, you know, you become, you start you zoning You have to diagnose more more. before you prescribe. Exactly, exactly. But I think one thing entrepreneurs do tend to come up with a, they think they know the problem and then they go with it, which I think, they, yeah. They, they, you know, in medicine, when you prescribe mm. without diagnosing, you get sued. Exactly, exactly. Right, and in business, when you prescribe before diagnosing, you go bankrupt. Exactly, yeah. Right, and yeah. That, but you're you're right that, that that so many people they fail because they don't take the time to diagnose. To actually diagnose, to the understand problem the well. problem. They yeah. think, you know, what I see is people they come up with a solution, then they go in search of the problem. That's exactly. And Th you're doing this sort of ethnographic yeah. way of it to understand it from the per person's point of view yes. that has the problem. Yes. Right. To really validate the problem yes. is, the, is the is the key. Exactly. It, it seems strange to me. Mm. The the formula for entrepreneurship is deceptively simple. It is. Well, now that I'm here, I'm saying that. Yeah. But 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 to the average person, it looks so mysterious. I know. And I, I think. That's, you know, if, if we're trying to understand like the entrepreneurial mindset, we have to have a conversation about the employee mindset. Yeah. Because you need one to, uh, it, it is the context with which to discuss the other. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so we're, we're sort of normalized and socialized into this employee way of thinking. Yes. And it's it never, yes. it, you know, we're taught since a very young age, you're going to work in a company. Mm where the useful thing, whatever that might be, has already been figured out. Mm. So, so you, you don't, don't need, even have to try. <laughs> you don't need to try. Yeah. You don't need the skills required to discover a useful thing. Mm. You know, yeah. it, it's sort of this industrial era of thinking, you're just going to deliver a useful thing in yeah. some way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we haven't really taught people the, the useful thing discovery skills. Yeah. And you can see it in the companies that are doing well now, other companies that have figured that out. Um, one of the things that I'm starting to think about in wanting to scale our company when we start employing people is how do we keep that culture going on? That culture of our employees being entrepreneurs in the company and wanting to contribute to innovation and not siloing them and um, making them just, oh, you do this and that's it. You know what I mean? How do we keep that culture of inquiry, constantly wanting to inquire, constantly wanting to solve a problem? Um, because at the end of the day, that also helps the company grow. It's right. not just having the entrepreneurs being the ones, the, the managers being the ones doing that, but you want to have that culture. You want to have a worker who's like, this process, there's a, there's a problem in this process. This is how I think we should be able to fix it better. And they would be the ones who are able to fix it better because they're on the ground and they're doing the work every single yep. day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I struggle with the same thing in my company. It's just, you don't, you don't, you know, it, it, it's interesting the, 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 the idea that, you know, the skills required to discover an opportunity are mm. distinct from the skills required to exploit that opportunity. Yes. Yes. And so what you're saying is like, how do you kind of keep them both yeah. going, right? Yeah. How do you, because, you need people to be efficient. Yeah, and exactly, exactly. But, There's but value in that, yeah. Efficiency is is like the death knell yeah. of innovation. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. If we're focused on being efficient, we're not likely to have insights. Yeah. Right? And those take the longest. And I think if, yeah, if you could start with trying, having the skill of trying to solve a problem or even figure out what a problem is. A lot of the time we don't even know what the problem is. Yeah. That's the more important skill to have. Once you understand the problem, then the implementation part of it can come in. Then all the other skills that you would have learned in corporate or all the other um, skills that are useful or generate productivity or efficiency, then you can apply those once having understood the problem well. Um, I think a lot of people don't even spend a lot of time in, in, in that phase of trying to figure out what the problem is. And those skills, putting in those skills, which are, as you're saying, they're not the most difficult thing ever. We always say, it's just about going and speaking to the customers, honestly. It's just going to speak to them, immerse yourself in their world, really try to get a good understanding of the end user of your product, because then that's the best way that you're able to understand what the problem is. Yeah. Um, and then, then from there, you can co-create even, co-create a solution 
with the customers, um, you know what I mean, to kind of create a product that you know that they like and that it's, it's, it's actually a testing or it's um, feeding into the problems that you know that they have. Um, so it's, it, but it's that skill, it's that, it's, that's the skill that I think is lacking in corporate, like you're saying, is killed in the workplace or in corporate. Um, but I'd also say a lot of entrepreneurial programs or things that try to teach entrepreneurship probably also lack in that, which is... Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I mean um, you're talking about problem-finding mm. skills, which I've seen evidence uh, showing that, that uh, actually CEOs mm. value workers who are good at problem finding mm. more so than those who have good at problem solving. solving yeah. and, and you know, great thinkers across time have said what you're saying and that, that, that you know, finding the problem and formulating the question mm. is about half the battle, that's if it. not more than half the battle. That's it. Right? Yeah. And so I, I think that's a good a little sound bite for people to hear. Like mm. it's really about finding mm. the right problem mm. to solve. Yeah. But here's the thing, it's so simple. Yeah. You need to be looking for problems to solve. That's it. And that's most people it. aren't. They're just trying to avoid problems. That's it. If you're looking for problems, once you have that mindset, which I, I'd say from the Allen Global Foundation, that's actually a skill that I got from there. Um, I remember there used to be this thing called ignitions that we used to do and basically ignitions we used to come up you find any problem anywhere and you just write to our your ELO mentor um, this is the problem and this is the solution. Simple mundane things like oh the, the plug is annoying me I think it should be like this or my mug is you know so we'd come up you, you constantly train your brain to be looking out for things and to be finding problems. That's it. That's yeah. it. So, so there's an excellent book uh, by Clayton Christensen from Harvard uh, uh, it's called Competing Against Luck. Mm. But what he talks about in this book is, is, is the ability to tease out the social and emotional dimension of human needs. Yeah. In addition to the functional dimension. Yeah. Because, so you have to be sort of a detective. Yeah. Right? Like, like we don't all make decisions based on functional. Yeah. There, there's deeper yes. social and emotional yes. dimensions of yes. our human needs. And, and, you know, people aren't walking around, let's say it's 1979, mm. people aren't walking around saying to themselves, geez, we really need a Starbucks. If somebody would yeah. make a $5 latte. That came latte, from a particular... Experiment. E exactly. A yeah. little experiment yeah. with an idea. And, exactly. And, and by the way, when, when, when Howard Schultz started Starbucks, coffee consumption in the U.S. was in decline. Yeah. So the business school professor that, would have said, probably don't, like waste time. don't do that. Yeah. You're wasting time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I think you really are onto something there. The, the idea of problem finding. Mm. Because what I learned with just even the, the, the thing of just going to people and speaking to them to find, that's when you find out exactly what you're saying, the social context, because sometimes you think you know what the problem is, and then you go speak to someone and you really find out, oh, it's actually the real problem is caused by the social emotional context. Yes. It was never a matter of functionality or that they needed something convenient or why right. this was, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that goes with just being with the end user. Yeah, you've really, got to be like a psychologist. Exactly. You've got to really understand and I, and I think that you know you become like an observer of human behavior, yes. right? At some point you do, yeah. But but when you get down to it, like so so I, I I've come to see sort of this basic assumption of the entrepreneur as as like it's up to me to mm. figure out how to make myself useful to other humans. Yeah, that's part of it. Right? Yeah. And and you kind of figure out like the more useful I become, the better mm. off I'm going to be. Yeah. It's almost like enlightened self-interest. Yes. yes. Right? You're yes. not just doing it for the money, though. Yes. Yes. When you, when you are able to create something that other people want and need and will pay for, mm. like this, this activates something in the individual. Yeah. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's where the engagement comes from. Yeah. Right? I agree. Yeah. And, and people make a big mistake thinking they're just driven, entrepreneurs are just driven by making no, money. No, no. I, I would say for me, with my company, it's not even about the money at all. It's great to have a profitable business and I want it to be a profitable, obviously I want it to be a profitable business. 
but I'm driven by wanting to solve this problem because I actually am very passionate about it as someone who's, in the, who's very passionate about clothing and fashion, but I don't want to contribute and wear nice clothes that I know are actually um, re responsible for someone not being paid a decent wage and working in, in bad working conditions right. and is contributing to all this textile waste. Um, that's just, you know, personally me. So I want to actually be, what, what, what can we do in this problem to try and solve it? Textile recycling. So that now when I do, one of the things that we want to do is actually create clothes from textile waste that look perfectly normal um, and same quality, same um, durability. When I wear those clothes, it's like I've solved my that, that problem. I can yeah. actually wear this because yeah. I know that it didn't contribute to that problem that I feel very strongly about. Um, in over and above the fact that it needs to be a profitable business and it needs to meet all the KPIs in terms of revenue and, and you know, all of that. Yeah. But it's actually, there's a, I'm seeing in the market that there's something that I want that isn't there. And I'm, I'm, I'm wanting, I'm putting myself up there to be like, yeah. I'm going to create it. I'm going to try to create it. Uh, but I, I, I think like, you know, I said to you a minute ago, like the, the sort of this core assumption of the entrepreneur is up to me to figure out mm. how to make myself useful to others. Mm. Where most of us are taught, someone else is going to tell you what's useful yeah. and you're going to do that thing, yeah. which guarantees a much, lever, much lower exactly. uh, uh, level of engagement, motivation, you know, all, and, and all those things. Mm. It's not really that complicated. It's just different mm. uh, from the way we've been taught to think. Mm. And I, I, I think... Uh, that's an important part of your story. Yeah, definitely. I would say, um, we were actually speaking about the other day, just the concept of having a cheerleader. Um, so having that, you can do it, you know, even as a child or in the school curriculum, you can do it. You, you can solve problems. You can be the one who creates things. Right. Once they said enough times, when you have a life coach and you have mentors, you have, and they keep on saying you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you eventually believe that you can do it. But if we're in a system that... Tells you you can't. You can't exactly. It trains you that you can't do it. You can't well, do it. Well, that's really what I wanted to get to. Is is is, is you know, I, I think what, what what I'm taking away from our conversation is to is is that you know we don't realize it, but we're teaching young people like this is the way the world is, and yeah. you're supposed to find your place in it. Yeah. And what we need to be teaching young people is this is the way the world is, and we need you to figure out how to make it better. And your place, and you can figure out your own place in the world. And not only find your place in it, but contribute to, to it. Exactly. Not just collect a paycheck and have a job. And I think now that I'm... I'm like looking at millennials and just at looking at my peers, not all the millennials, just looking at my peers, I think that feeling is incredibly frustrating, even though they haven't realized it yet that the reason they have a lot of frustration is because they're being told to fit into a system. But I think with millennials, it, you, we have this self-awareness now that we don't like the way things are and this, this ideal kind of version of this is, you know, eight to five job for the rest of your lives, we're not really jacking with that idea anymore. I think there is that kind of feeling coming up with a lot of yep. um, young people, just noticing with my friends that they're in the system and they're going, they've went to school and now they're gonna, they're in great jobs that they thought they wanted their whole lives, but it's somehow not fulfilling it's them. Empty. It's empty. And it is because you, you haven't been given a room to even think about what you really would like to do. And I think that's the itch on their back is that I think I want to think about what I want to do, but they're not even being given that space. You know what is interesting? I, I'm, I'm reading about sort of the history of like how the systems of education mm. came about. And, and there was a guy in the U.S. around the, in the 1900s named, named um, Frederick Winslow Taylor. Mm. And he designed something called... Um, scientific management theory. So this was a guy that figured out how to maximize your output on the assembly line. Yeah. How yeah. to make the task so you didn't have to reach yeah. too far. Yeah. Exactly how much, how big the shovel would be so you could maximize how much coal yeah. you could shovel in a day. And, and this guy, you know, so, so became very, very influential in mm. the school system. Mm. Uh. And, right? So the schools are designed to feed the factory, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and he wrote something to the effect of, and I'm paraphrasing, but, but you know, how dare you mm. think that you can contribute? <laughs> yeah. 
but that's that's that, that, that thinking that that yeah thinking that you can contribute is what 50, we need 80 percent of it yeah it's 80 percent of it yeah and yeah just looking at my journey and growing up having parents who continuously encourage me to think of myself as not just fitting into something you know what i mean and just thinking that you can do it you can solve anything you can do anything you can be a ballerina you can be whatever you want to do you my, my, it even got to a point where i'd be like sometimes i want my mom to tell me what to do because i'm so young and i and i don't know what to yeah. do yeah well that's a good point though you know because what I mean? Because we don't like ambiguity. Yeah, and right? it's I mean, weird we, we having have... that freedom sometimes of just being able to completely explore what is it that you want to do. But once you have that space and you realize that you can contribute and that also contributing is not this mystified thing. Contributing is as easy as waking up every day and say, having a few things to do and then doing them. And then next day you have more things and then those things will actually accumulate into something that's growing in front of you. That's all it is. Um, but yeah. currently it looks like obviously this mystified role and process and yeah. um, the, the system is not doing much to incentivize people to think differently. So yeah, here we are. Yeah, here we are. This <laughs> yeah. has been great. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so thank much, you. That Gary. That was just really great. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh